then I will be confronted by people who say to me now, well, what happened to the lottery money? We will assume that we would have fixed it. And the economist is telling me right now, it won't be enough. Right. Well, you know, that's, they're losing ADA because parental choice, parents are making a choice of where to send their school, their kids. And let's be clear, there are public charters that our public dollars pay for, then there are private not-for-profits. And so again, collectively, as Californians, we have to have the conversation about what's best for your own kids. Okay, hang on one second. We'll let him finish. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you're suggesting that we could separate those two issues? Huh? Are you suggesting that we could separate those two issues? I would argue that we can't. And parents are choosing to send their children there. But, though, but there are things called public charters, that they are public schools that are charters. They are, they are governed under LAUSD or the LA County Office of Education. And so it's complicated. And so another issue, folks will come up every year with the position of LAUSD is just too big, let's split it up. That's another political third rail from my perspective. And so I wonder if at this point, if the pigs out the barn and if we're in a position to turn that around and stop as you say I'm going to use your words so you won't quote me subsidizing charter schools uh, the charter school association rolls deep we've seen that in terms of their influence and the composition of LAUSD school board I think it's appropriate to frame it as a Pro charter, generally school board, and yet that's fascinating to me that that school board has now voted to put the moratorium on charters. So let's, you know, politics plays into all these. I wish it was as simple. I told the economists, I wish I had your life where I could look at the pure mechanics of what you think is best and make it be. Politics plays into all those decisions. Thank you. <laughs> and that's why we're here as a Democratic club, so you all are educated and reach out to us and tell us your perspectives. Y yeah, that's why I'm there. It's my day job. But I'm also a California resident. I'm a voter like you. And all of us have a responsibility to understand the complexity and intricacies of these decisions and be informed as we vote and communicate with our elected officials. Yes. I'm clear. I'm clear. I'm clear. I get it. I get it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate your perspective.
there are a variety of issues. I, first of all, thank you for taking the time to call and write. That's really important. There are a variety of factors that we have to factor into. And for me to change a vote from committee to the floor is a big deal. Um, um, and so I appreciate you taking the time to reach out to your elected official. And you all should continue to do so. Yes, sir. There. <laughs> it said that a lot of our uh, elected officials are putting their, their nose under the tent regarding the ADEM election. And a lot of them did. But this lady didn't. She's fabulous. And she speaks truth to power and she listened to us. When we first brought the Inglewood oil field to you, you didn't want to hear it, but we kept on bringing it. And then you did. That's not true. I didn't want to hear it. What I said was, what I said was, I'm going to carry the bill, and I'm not going to uh, have a sponsor because I'm not going to be, you know, beholden to a particular group's perspective that I need to be able to draft policy based on me being in the moment, in, the, in Sacramento every day, that I think we can get through. So it's not that I didn't want to do it. I just wasn't going to let one group be the sponsor. But That's all. I did. I'll always listen. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom Camarella. Thank you. So what well, Tom is saying, apology. So I saw this video, and it said, and you know, those elected officials, and they only appoint their friends. And I was like, hold up. So I use so social media, and that's me posting. And so I said, well, this, this says that elected officials. I said, well, actually, I don't do that. Never have. I've never engaged. I said, and quite frankly, a lot of you keep asking me for endorsements. So you see, it cuts both ways. It, when I don't endorse... I don't endorse, and it can either help you or hurt you, but at least you know where I'll be. I believe the party, the politics of the party, are for community activists. I have my sandbox, and if you go through the Dem Party platform, as I did once to show Kara, I went through and highlighted the party platform. You all spent a great deal of time developing that document. And when I went through, I highlighted one color of bills I've carried, budget actions I've championed, and another color items I voted in support of. And I had highlighted the entire party platform. So that's my way of being engaged. You all do the work. You are the activists. I've spent more time in my life as an activist than, you know, the man <laughs> as the elected official. And so that's how I think. And I'm clear that there is a role and space for you, and we are to partner. I'm not trying to get in your business. And I need you to help inform what I do on your behalf here. So I have said, not everybody. Watch yourself now. So that was the point of the apology. Thank you, Mr. Camarella. In the back. In 1978, she lost her job because of the Jarvis bill. Ooh, wee, she's called us out. She said, how many of you who are homeowners in this room would vote to get rid of Prop 13? That's her question. They, she said, in its entirety or split role? In its entirety or split role, she said. She said, in its entirety. Okay. So, you know, I have to tell you, when people, when I first was on budget committee and, and, and the deficit was still pretty high, people would come up and say, you know, and we're not funding education, and all that money is going to prisons. And so I would say, well, did you vote for three strikes? Because if you did, what did you think was going to happen? And so sometimes when we look at these ballot initiatives, we have a responsibility to be chess players and think three and four moves down the road. So with three strikes, when we decided to incarcerate more people for longer, where did we think they were going to go? They were going to go into state prisons that we were going to build, and we were going to staff. And at that time, during that just amazing wave of state prison construction, CCPOA, California Correctional and Peace Officers Association became the strongest lobby in the state. They trumped CTA and CMA. What do we think was going to happen? 
Now, the important part of these kinds of exercises is also for us all to be informed. That is not true that the corrections budget is bigger than education or health. It's not. Education and health are the biggest pieces of the pie that I still have control over because thanks to ballot box budgeting, the piece of the pie that we have control over as a legislature, you assembly members and senators, gets smaller and smaller. With Prop 98, with Prop 10, where voters are saying we want 50% of every new dollar to go to education. So the slice of the pie that we have control over gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so we see the big cuts in education and health because that's the biggest slice that we still have control over. Is correction still funded? pretty high. Not really. It's, it's in the single digits in terms of percent of our overall general fund. That will continue to shrink thanks to ballot initiatives, 47, 57, and others, and as the prison population shrinks. Now, it's not going to go to zero because there will still be people in the state prison. But as we shrink that population, as we bring out-of-state prisoners back in state, as we close the private prisons, it's going to take a minute for us to see it in the budget because we still have movement. It's like if you have four kids and one goes off to college, you still have to pay the house mortgage. <laughs> so until we're able to mothball whole institutions, we're not going to see significant drop in the correction budget. We're just not. I'm going to take one more question here, and I'm going to give you back to your meeting. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, the, the LA Times did a I thought very fair write up when I moved from sub three chair to budget chair. Sub three was health and human services, and I have a reputation of being a strong advocate for working families and their children. And so. Even in that capacity, I understand that I have, I'm the chair of the committee, and so I can't always put my agenda on the table. I don't think that's appropriate. And so there was question, how will she make this transition to full budget chair? Will it be a Mitchell budget? Will, you know, what will it be? And so I was very sensitive to that, because I needed, I needed to be sensitive to all these other areas of the budget, and to make sure that my colleagues had confidence in my ability to manage the process and lead them. Uh, LA Times did a lovely piece where they said um, Senator uh, Leno, the previous chair of the Budget Committee, um, referred to me as the conscious of the Senate, which I was very flattered by. And so I've worked very hard to manage a process and give full inclusion and participation. Senator Nielsen, my, uh, the dean of the Senate, he served years ago and has come back, is the vice chair. Senator Nielsen wrote me a beautiful text the other day thanking me for all of the effort I go through to make sure that every member of the budget committee is heard and feels a part. If you're willing to step up and do the work, I'm willing to work with you. And so I work collaboratively with my caucus, the Dem caucus in the Senate. I work collaborative with, collaboratively with the pro tem. And I perceive my role as facilitating a process where all of us can have input into what we feel, because we are the majority party, the priority should be. Are there areas of the budget where you see a Holly Mitchell influence? Of course. There are areas of the budget where you see influence for other members who sit on budget committee. But I believe my job is to facilitate a process, work collaboratively with my colleagues, and so we have a budget priority list that the Democrats in the Senate have a sense of ownership in. That's what I do. I said that's the last one. I'm going to sign off so you can go. Huh, that's a place to go, too. That's a place to go, too. I appreciate you all for showing up in the rain because Carl was going, I'm not sure what she was going to do if you hadn't shown up. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation. I hope that you will. Uh, Hannah, let's give them the website to Next. Is it Next 10? Yeah, it's uh, the Next 10 um, organization, but it's budgetchallenge.org. Budgetchallenge.org. Org. Get it in your newsletter, budgetchallenge.org. And I would say they should go on it. When did they tell you they had the 19 budget up? So, so give it to the end of February. So when you do your exercise, you're not doing the 2018 budget. You're doing the proposed budget. 
and I can't wait to see you all out and about so you can tell me, yeah, it wasn't easiest, but this is what I prioritize, so this is what I want you to prioritize. I know that's what you're going to tell me. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Hannah. Uh, they want to go Great. And I want to make sure everybody knows Hannah Cho, my new district director. Hannah, wave your hand. Uh, Hannah has uh, been an active, uh, relatively new to the state from the great state of Georgia. You can hear, you can hear. She's an Atlanta girl. She's a Georgia peach. Go ahead, Georgia peach. Um, very active in the Democratic Party, serves in the DNC th the, with the, uh, yes. So you all will see Hannah out and about. All right, thank you for the invitation. I appreciate you. Um, Hannah, we're going to do the picture with the with the board. Uh, first, we're going to do we'll do the executive board, and then we're gonna, and then everybody can come in, and we can have a really big picture. Yeah. You know what? We're going to take a picture 